Hey Christina, I thought it might be easier if I made a video. Um, I wanted to tell my story and, and then this way you can get some nonverbals. Um, so I, I, um, I invested in Torchlight. They're a gas and oil company. It was, yes, it was a squeeze play. Um, I had done a few, um, basically at that point in my life, um, my husband's in the Air Force and we had recently moved from um, the DC area uh, to uh, the panhandle of Florida. And um, I have lupus and I, I, I was very, very sick. And, you know, my immune system was compromised and we were in the middle of a full-blown pandemic. And we had just moved and uh, it was very isolating, very isolating. Um, my youngest was three at the time. And, and it was hard because every, the whole world was shut down. And so you can't really bloom where you're planted. I, I, um, had been a stay at home mom, but even if I wanted to go to work, my, my health was not going to allow me to, right? Because I was just so sick. Um, in fact, my daughter, uh, she went from the three day preschool program to the five day because I couldn't enrich her at home. Honestly, it got to the point where I couldn't even lift myself out of bed or take myself to use the restroom. I needed help with those things. Um, and, uh, and, and so my training was as a social worker. I was a trauma counselor and, um, and, and it was hard because, you know, my daughter was in school. So I felt like, you know, my role as a stay at home mom um, you know, I just wanted to feel like I could contribute to the family and to do something. And, and I had been in crypto in the past and I was like, you know what, like so many during, um, the pandemic, I decided to try my hand at trading and, um, I had some okay experiences. Um, and I also had some really bad experiences, but that's how we learn. Um, I'm, I'm not afraid to say when I've made a mistake in training. I just want to put that out there because um, that's a narrative too um, that is pushed that, that retail might be angry because they were at the bad end of a trade. Um, and, and I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think it's injustice is, is why a lot of people are frustrated and, and rightly so. Um, so I, I decided to try trading. I had a friend who had told me about... Um, some stuff that she was in, Torchlight Energy. And Torchlight was a gas and oil company. Um, they're small cap. And what was happening to them, like so many other small caps, um, was they were basically subjected to predatory shorting, um, counterfeit, naked shorting. Um, and, and one of the main purposes for that is so that um, if they can short a company into the ground, then they don't have to pay back their short position. So whether or not it was, you know, shorts or hedge funds that are shorting, illegally shorting with these naked shorts companies to the point of bankruptcy, whether it's to um, not have to pay back their short position or maybe like, um, you know, maybe uh, GTS works with Chevron, right? And they're one of the companies that it looks like they possibly could have been heavily involved in shorting Torchlight. Um, and maybe in getting MMTLP trading, which we'll talk about later, but they also one of their biggest clients is Chevron. So there's also this whole concept of hostile takeovers, right? Where they want to short a company into the ground so that they can essentially take their assets um, or take them over um, on the cheap. And so that was kind of the fate that Torchlight was um, directing and they were being directed to. And um, John Berta, who's an incredible person, He's the CEO of Torchlight at the time, and he realized and recognized what was going on. And it was frustrating, I'm sure, because it didn't seem like, um, you know, the SEC or regulatory bodies that are supposed to protect these companies are actually doing what they needed to do to protect companies and do retail. And so he had to think outside of the box. And so he started interviewing companies and he found Metamaterials, which was a Canadian company. It's an up and coming tech company. They make um, Metamaterials, so materials not found in nature that can do cool things that things you find in nature can't do, like battery separators are also working on non-invasive glucose monitoring. So super cool tech, right? But it's not a gas and oil company. And so, um, it was very fascinating because, you know, the anticipation and the, the belief was that when the merger happened, that these shorts would be forced to cover. Um, unfortunately, that was not the case. They, they held their positions through the merger. And um, 
so metamaterials, they, they obviously don't need these gas and oil assets. So, so basically what happens is um, for those of us that were um, torch holders through the record date and, and held through the merger, which there was also a reverse split that will come into play too. So it became a two to one. Um, they they had rights to these this dividend or these assets. So they were placed in a placeholder with your broker account. Um, and, and I hope I'm speaking this correctly because I am kind of new at this and I'm not an expert. I'm just trying to convey what I saw. Um, so they were put in these placeholders tell that they are not tradable. It's just something set there aside until there's like a sell of the assets or spin out or, you know, whatever, whatever Metamaterials decides to do with these assets. So they're set aside. And um, and we were we were waiting for the T plus whatever dates for these these shorts to be forced to cover, and it just didn't happen. And then we watched as Meta Materials was shorted into the ground. I mean, um, for multiple reasons. But you got to remember, all the shorts that were in Torchlight, they they were now in um, MMAT, and also since they held through the merger they had an obligation for um, providing any dividends or anything that might come from these assets. So if, if you had a massive short position, which they probably did because they were shorting Torch for like a decade, then it would be very concerning these assets, right? Because this was a liability for you, especially, I mean, during the pandemic, gas prices had tanked, but then gas prices started trickling up. I mean, this is even pre-Ukraine, right? So it started it started stabilizing as the world started getting back to normal. And then um, something very interesting happened. Um, and and it, it, it's fascinating. And I suggest to anybody who is interested in this look into it further because this is where the very obvious corruption starts um i mean we knew there was corruption but this was like the blatant you you can't you can't explain away kind of corruption um these assets that were set in this placeholder they began trading they began trading on the otc market they began trading without the permission of the meta materials or you know torchlight not that it would have mattered because he wasn't the ceo anymore um but everybody was kind of like, what, what's going on? Why, why are these trading? They're supposed to, you know, supposed to just sit there until we get like a dividend. So people were waiting for an amount of money to show up in their account because we were like, okay, what's it, you know, what's it going to sell for? And there was um, some people that were really great. Um, Bird Lady is one of them um, um, who were kind of calculating the value of these assets. Um, Rich Masterson, he's a geologist, um, he did a survey. I mean, these were really prime assets in the Permian Basin and they had a lot of gas and oil. And so there's there's um, a lot of hope for them. And, and so I'm sure that must have been hopefully a little bit scary for the shorts, but you know, they're always trying to think of how can I get out of this without the least damage? At least that's kind of what I envisioned. So when these these assets started trading on the pink sheets in these OTC markets under the ticker symbol MMTLP, I anticipated, well, I believe, sorry, I'm, I'm not good with my verbiage, but I believe that um, they wanted people to see a value in their accounts. May it be 30 cents, um, may it, you know, because it was like under a dollar for a while, it popped up to $3, but then it dropped back down. So they wanted people to see an amount and assume that that was the dividend and then be like, cool, um, and then sell at that point in time. And so then they could purchase those shares um, and, and then their obligation to cover um, would be met. Um, and that and that's far less expensive than, you know, as, as as things happened with like Ukraine and stuff, the price of oil started going up and up and up and up and up. So, I mean, some of the valuation of the shares is like, you know, just more, just a little more than $100 a share. Or, you know, what if, um, what if like Oxy, Occidental Petroleum or another oil company came in and it purchased um, these assets later? I mean, then they would be on the hook like what, what if it was a non-taxable event and so then you got shares or something in it for a company that's trading over $100. This would be very, very um, catastrophic almost. I mean, this could create a bankruptcy event for people who've been just carelessly shorting for you know a decade so um we we now know that um 
you know, two market makers, I guess, could get together and get it trading, but they would have had to have um, forged documentation. And um, whether it was a Form 211 or a bypass, FINRA had to approve it. And um, we're not sure if, if um, you know, the people involved, if it was negligence or if they were um, complicit in a part of the uh, fraudulent activity that got MMTLP trading, but something really bad happened. And they would have had to have started this process. It seems like they would have had to have started because it takes such a long time before the merger had even actually occurred. So it's kind of like they were had their game plan um, before the merger even took place. Like why we won't cover because we're not gonna be forced to cover. And then the assets won't be a problem because we can, you know, nefariously get them trading because you know there's this is speculation this is speculation but um there is some connection to like Ari Rubenstein that was Stein who was the um the head of GTS um who like I said earlier is one of the people that is implicated in possibly um you know being involved in getting MMTLP trading and highly shorting um both MMTLP and um you know, Torchlight, uh, he was on the board of FINRA and he had to step down because he had some legal issues, but you know, he's still well connected, right? And and that's kind of speaks to the systemic corruption that we're seeing where, um, you know, people who work for hedge funds, um, they, hedge funds donate to politicians, politicians appoint people in the SEC, the SEC um, grows the lawyers that go work for the hedge funds, the big banks that help the hedge funds do these shorting and swaps. They go and I mean like Gary Gensler is a Goldman Sachs guy. So there's, it's a self licking ice cream cone. And, and whether it's complacent or complicit, either way they had an obligation to protect retail and something's going seriously wrong at the expense of these companies that are bringing innovation and at the expense of retail who's, um, you know, anybody who has a retirement, anybody who has money in um, a 401k, anybody who has money in a TSP. So, um, so yeah, so that, so there are these bad actors and they, and they try and, you know, make a buck at the expense of, you know, the everyday person. And, and that's what was happening with MMTLP. But, but the interesting thing that happened was, you know, they, people see this price value in their account, but they know the value of these assets in the Permian Basin. So instead of selling, they start purchasing, um, a lot. <laughs> and, um, and that doesn't bode well. And so, for anybody who was short. And one of the, the ways that these market makers manipulate the price of stocks is they, they will short um, to bring the, the price down um, and create fear and doubt. And so we saw, we, I mean, there was a complete smear campaign on, you know, the, the oil assets. There's no, there's no oil or um, th things against um, John Berta. We, we were seeing it at the same time against George Palacaris, the CEO of Meta Materials and, and this, the um, just campaign against his company. Um, and, and it's really interesting because, you know, it, it's this whole psychological component to trading where, you know, you can even have, have media, you can pay to have media, um, you know, um, not saying this is why, but I have my suspicions, like possibly seeking alpha um, investor place. They publish these, these, articles that are disparaging towards these companies so that these shorts can go in and make more money um, and then it, because it creates this fear also um, another thing that's very interesting is the psychological component on uh, social media right because then they create these accounts and they pretend to be like shareholders and they they go into your space calls and they they uh, they try and pit the like the community against each other because if you can split people up, then they're no longer as strong as they were when they were a united front. And then we see that like within a ticker, and then we also have been seeing that like um, with other like company to company. So like you'll have a group of people who maybe are like into AMC or um, you know people like my people like that were in MMAT Meta Materials or MMTLP the dividend that started trading. So if you can make these people fight and not come together then you've weakened them and so so we were seeing a whole bunch of that but people kept purchasing and um and Ukraine happened and Russia and the 
the price of gas and oil just kept getting higher. And so the, the idea of these assets became more um, tempting because, you know, you could purchase them for what, like three bucks or something, and, and they would be valued at like possibly over a hundred dollars. And then the company comes out and says that it's going to spin out into uh, Meta Materials comes out and says that it's going to spin these assets out into a private company. It's going to be next to bridge hydrocarbons. And so um, the process begins to start spinning out these gas and oil assets. Um, and it starts in the summer of 2022. Uh, sorry, it's been such a long time. So it started, okay, the merger was I believe end of June ish 21. Um, the assets started trading on the OTC under MMTLP. Um, it was like October 6th or 7th, 21. Um, mind you, it would have had to have the process probably started pre merger. So at, at that point in time, I should probably say um, George Palacaris and John Berta went to. Uh, FINRA and the SEC and they said hey look he, there was no permission given for these assets to begin trading and basically they said too bad so sad and um, they're trading and they're not going to do anything about it even though they acknowledged that they were trading fraudulently so so every day the MMTLP traded was we, we talk about this concept of FINRA fraud every day that it traded was um, was just another way to um, highlight the fact that FINRA has defrauded the company, defrauded retail investors. But sorry, I, <laughs> I, I have a hard time staying on track. So fast forward a bit. And remember, we're talking about this spin out is going to happen. The SEC um, is they finally, after months and months and um, four amendments, which, you know, I, I'm new to the process, so I don't know. It seemed like it was taking a long time, but maybe that was normal. Um, they finally approved the S1 for this spin out to next bridge hydrocarbons. And then the next uh, process is it goes to FINRA. And um, that was taking a very long time and people were getting very concerned because the S1 indicated these dates um, and the, t the time was ticking. And so we wanted, what we wanted as a community is we wanted the, the S1 to be approved. It gets approved by the SEC and it gets approved by FINRA. And then it goes to the DTC who gives out the corporate actions to the brokers. That means that they say, hey, basically shorts, you have to close your position. So it's forced closure. And so we were worried that, you know, we had these dates of when it was actually going to spin out. We wanted to make sure that there was time for these shorts to actually close their positions. And so um, so we started calling FINRA um, a lot, uh, speaking to the ombudsman, uh, filing with the SEC. We started getting very vocal as a community because we were very frustrated. And we had already seen, like with FINRA, that they weren't necessarily um, – on our side and so we have a lot of doubt in in the systems that are supposed to protect us or supposed to be doing their jobs because we've seen them not act in our best interests and 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 so finally um they approve the s1 um and it goes to the the dtc oh oh but but interestingly, FINRA changed the dates. They changed the dates on the S1. So um, it was just by a couple of days. It didn't seem like a big deal. And then they changed the word um, canceled to deleted. And um, so basically now this new timeline was, and, and it seemed like it would work out just fine, last day for retail to purchase to be eligible to go into Nextbridge Hydrocarbons as a private company was on the 8th. And then um, the 9th and the 12th, so because there's a weekend, the 9th and 12th were trading days that were closed position only. And the reason for that being was that these short positions, that that's when the corporate actions go out. That's when they're forced to close. That's when reconciliation happens so that you don't have um, these counterfeit shares trying to go over into a private company that only has 165 million seats at the table. And so um, it was really interesting because that last day of trading, they shorted this thing. I mean, it had been at like $12 and then they had it at $10, but then they shorted it down to $2.90 and no one was selling. 
No one was selling. I mean, why why would they? Because we're all anticipating, like, there's a lot of people that want to go into Next Bridge. They want to take their shares over there, but there's a lot of people, you know, who wanted to sell. And why would you sell if the shorts haven't been forced to close yet? Because this is this is a unique squeeze opportunity where it's not like really retail purchasing that creates the squeeze, it's the covering, right? And uh so it just it just made sense for people to, to hold out a little bit, but then we're seeing it short and we're like, okay, this is weird. Maybe they just want to bring the price down before they have to cover. Um, and, and so we wait, but on, on the ninth at like 1 AM ish FINRA and they issue something called a U3 halt, which indicates that there was a significant event. There was, um, liquidity issues. They, they halt our stock. They, they halt the stock that was never supposed to even trade. It was, it was devastating to so many because you know, it's supposed to be canceled by like the 14th, like the 13th is the, the last day for closing and they halted it. They basically said, hey, shorts, you don't have to cover your position. And then they created this mess because all these short positions are still open, all these counterfeit shares. And then there's this private company that needs this reconciliation because they only have 165 million seats at the table. I mean, they, they can't dilute to accommodate for all of these shares that have been introduced illegally into the market. So, so FINRA doing that, you know, maybe the DTC, they opened up the books and they went, oh my gosh, Oh my gosh, there's so, so many counterfeit shares because we've got this whole decade of torch. And then we've got even after MMTLP started trading, when people just started buying and buying and buying, and essentially they were probably buying these synthetic counterfeit shares. And it was probably a scenario, and I don't know because I wasn't there, but I envisioned that it was probably a scenario where they look at it and they go, oh my gosh. This is such a mess. This is going to create a market event that is going to be very detrimental and it's going to shake to the core um, people's views and opinions on, on the security of the market. We have to halt this and we have to figure this out on the back end. And so they did. They halted it. And, um, you know, the 14th goes by and time keeps going by. <laughs> I, I, funny enough, I had to have a hysterectomy and I had it scheduled for the 14th because I was like, oh, all my trading stuff will be done. I'll have all my shares that I needed to go into next bridge, going to next bridge, and then I'll sell some and blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I had surgery on the 14th and, and by the 19th of December, because I couldn't drive, I had my, my son who was visiting for the holidays, drive me an hour over to, to where the FBI building was, um, because I couldn't drive at that point. And I, I filed with them. We were filing, um, with our, the SEC, we were filing complaints with FINRA. We were talking to our politicians, um, you know, the IC3.gov for the FBI um, was a resource I was told about when I went and visited them. So everybody was just kind of bombarding and, and trying to get media outlets um, to pick this up. It became very frustrating, um, maybe because what happened to us was traumatic. You know, um, I didn't purchase my MMTLP. I had my, my legacy torch to MMTLP, my shares that I got from the merger, but a lot of people did purchase. A lot of people purchased at $10 and, and, and people want to vilify or demonize them for that decision, but they didn't do anything wrong because we have these, these procedures in place. And, and when somebody is, let's say you're playing Monopoly, right? And, and you find out that somebody's cheating or, you know, that person realizes that they're going to be losing and they're like, all right, and then you just pick up the whole board game and say, we're done, we're not playing anymore. And then you're like, but wait, I was about to build a hotel on Park Place. Like it just, it, this was right before Christmas time too. You know, there's there's so many stories of the devastation that people experienced and, and now, you know, nothing has happened since then. I mean, things have happened, but we still haven't had the the resolution that we've been looking for or that we deserve. 
and there's a lot of people who you know they they put their money from their other investments into MMTLP and now they they are their taxes are coming due and they can't even show a loss for that year because it's all just in limbo. And um, so some interesting things have happened since then. Um, and it's actually kind of beautiful because we were looking for outside resources to help us. We were, you know, talking to all these people and hoping that somebody would do their job and that somebody would understand. And I'm not saying that there might not be something in the background like the, the finance committee. Um, they may be doing something, but as for right now, it's been very difficult because we, we haven't really seen the action and there, there hasn't been really um, that communication to us that things were getting done. And, um, and so that, that's been really hard for people, but we weren't willing to give up. And so we organized and we organized in a big way. I had started Twitter spaces with meta materials back in, oh my gosh, it's been like a year and a half. At that point in time, no one was doing them. And then December came and then we had Marduk and he was doing them like 24 seven. And then we started having people in the community and we were taking shifts because like I said, this was a traumatic experience. This was an injustice that happened to us and we realized that the system was broken and it wasn't, the system that we believed was designed to protect us was in fact harming us. And so, so we started organizing through spaces, um, and collaborating and working together and, and realizing the skill sets that so many people had. We had people that had legal backgrounds um, and they, you know, not not as legal advisors, but they can inform us. And then um, we had people with digital art experience. We had Hollywood Henry created a website, fairmarketsnow.org. And then and then, you know, like we're just looking in our community and and then it gets to the point where we start realizing that our voices are so much stronger when we work together with others. And so um, Mike, the Marine, he was got the permits and was organizing Occupy SEC. Um, we had Rosa, who has her um, lawsuit in the federal courts in Florida. Um, I, I hope I don't miss any. I mean, I know I'm missing so many people because I wish I could just explain to you just the amazing gifts that so many had and that they were so willing to share, you know, without, without compensation, without being paid and the collaboration and in the spirit of desiring change, change that's needed and change that's good. Um, and, and so Occupy SCC happens. It was probably one of the most amazing experiences of my life. Um, I dressed up like Lady Liberty um, Katie Cat dressed up like Lady Justice and we were in front of the SEC saying, you know, we have demands for free and fair markets. Um, this is not the country that that we thought we were living in. Um, it's like this veil has been lifted and, and we see all these problems, but we can still fix them. It's not it's not like you know, we're like, okay, it's it's past hope. We have hope and, and we want to make change and change is needed and we have to do it now because we can't kick this down to our kids. You know, um, it was so interesting because then like my eyes are open to so many people in the community, like I was saying, like, um, you know, Mike from the AMC community, um, but then even like not even social media. Then I learn about Christina Copeland and, um, her video or her documentary, The Wall Street Conspiracy, and um, I learn about Darren Saunders, who, you know, 23 years ago was picketing outside of Wall Street, asking people about naked shorting and trying to explain to them how it's going to be the detriment of our markets, creating, you know, economic fragility, fragility in our national security. Um, you need to hear his story if you haven't. I, I really highly recommend it. But, um, then, then I get introduced to Jeremy Frommer, who um, creates CEO Block, and it's beautiful because you know um, John Berta stepped up. I know George Palacaris is doing things in the background, and he's kind of keeping a low profile, um, but he's still doing stuff. Um, John Berta is very vocal. He joined CEO Block with Jeremy Frommer, um, who is just an amazing human, who is really um, helping to help us organize, um, to become a more powerful voice, to elevate us. 
Um, and, and then I, I meet Heather from Naked Truth at um, this rally and I learn about her nonprofit and all the work that she's doing. And I have hope. I mean, we, we haven't seen resolution um, yet for MMTLP. Um, and 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 I, I hope this doesn't sound insensitive, but MMTLP, what happened to that community is great and terrible in so many ways. Terrible for the obvious reasons that I've stated. Terrible because you know, people's lives were destroyed from this. Um, but great at the same time because it's so egregious. Um, it's so obviously wrong. The corruption is so visible um, that it created an opportunity for um, retail, not just MMTLP holders. It just it invigorated it invigorated this grassroots movement towards change and um and there had been so many who had been going through this fight prior you know the the amc community the gme community you've got bbig um jeremy frommer's company crtd um finger fi fngr um there's just there's this whole list it goes on and on and on of these people who are just so frustrated and so sick of seeing these companies, this innovation, these lives being destroyed. And so they were starting to step up. And we stepped up in a big way. And now we're looking at marrying our efforts. And I'm so hopeful because I know that when we are united, they've been fighting to keep us divided, but it's not working anymore. And so I just have this joy and this this calmness but excitedness at the same time because I think we can do it. And the beauty of it is we're not doing it just as MMTLP. We're not doing it just as GameStop or GTII or, you know, any of those tickers. We're doing it together. And we're doing it together not just for, you know, our companies but we're that that we believe in, but we're doing it for anybody who has retirement. Um, it truly is an economic revolution. It is a shift. Um, it, it's going to be a shift. It's going to be a redistribution. Um, it's going to be a redistribution of opportunities. Opportunities that were not given to the everyday average person because the system was rigged. Um, but if we can really create the change, then it gives the opportunity that you know everyone deserves. Who is a market participant so um i guess that's where i'm going to stop my video i like stopping my video at hope it, it's what keeps me going and i haven't always been hopeful there's been some really dark times uh like last week <laughs> but um but i just keep going and we all keep going because we believe in this movement and and that's that's the beauty of it how do you how do you stop authentic passion. I don't think they can. So we're here and we're here for change.